If you are just catching up on the markets today, it was another rough one. The Dow down more than 1,000 points. The S&P 500 losing 3.5%, but big tech taking it even harder. The NASDAQ down 5%, now hitting its lowest level since November of 2020. Well, the energy ETF, the biggest one, the XLE, it did fall a little bit today, but it was up earlier in the session, and it is the only green S&P sector year to date. Now, many energy names breaking new records this week. Commodities as well. Look at natural gas. It's more than doubled this year. Diesel prices soaring to new highs. By the way, if you can find diesel here in the Northeast. And lots of names also reading, recently hitting new highs, like Devon Energy, Phillips 66 at ExxonMobil. Let's talk more about it all and bring in Michael Bradley, partner of Energy Market Strategy at Veritim. To talk through this Veritim new firm created by Mike and some partners from Tudor Pickering and Holt. Mike, it's great to have you on. Listen, uh, before we get into the individual stock names, I want to talk about oil. Oil was over 110 today. It ended a little bit lower, but it was 111 and change earlier today, even with the coming release, the 160 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and the Senate moving one step closer today to allowing the president to sue OPEC for market manipulation. I mean, it all seems like it's adding up to a higher oil price over time. What do you think? Yeah, Brian, I mean, look, it's, it's all about supply and demand, right? And right now, we just don't have the supply. You know, if you look at OPEC, OPEC is basically maxed out. We only have a couple million barrels of spare capacity. And so it's really about demand. How, how far does demand have to go down or how far does price have to go up, you know, to hit demand? And we just don't know what that is yet. I mean, we talk about 125, 150, some people up there and $175. We don't know. Demand is going to have to basically be hit. It's going to have to get hit. We're going to see where price goes. That's what's going to determine. But there's, there's no reason it can't go higher this year because guess what? You know, we're heading into summer, and that's seasonally a lot stronger period uh, than we've been in the last couple of quarters. Yeah, and I think the question that everybody's been asking, Mike, and you've been doing this a long time, my man, is where does that demand destruction kick in? I was in California, well, really yesterday morning, 6, 650 a gallon, and not by the freeway, by the way. That was pretty much every station in L.A., but there were lines. I mean, there's people pulling in and filling up because they have to. Is there a price point? where demand destruction begins to kick in? Because we were higher in 08, inflation adjusted. Yeah, we just haven't seen it yet. It's not $100, obviously. Uh, is it 125 We don't know. Is it 150 We don't know. We're going to find out, you know, in, in a fairly quick fashion. Like I said, we're going into a seasonally strong period here uh, in summer. We have China that's kind of a, you know, a lot of the uh, of China's off right now. And so when they do come back on, we're just going to have a really, really strong demand. And, and we're just not going to have supply there. So we're going to find out pretty quickly. Hey, Michael, it's Karen Feinerman. Thanks for being on. How do you think the China slowdown fits into this equation um, for where the price of oil would be? And or would they be buying it from Russia at a steep discount? What do you th how do you think this plays out? Well, like I said, it's going to be we're, we're, we're going on a seasonally strong period here. You know, the Fed is raising rates and really is not doing anything at this point in time. But, you know, one of the things, like I said beforehand, is that, you know, in previous periods, we had supply dictating, uh, you know, what price did. We're just not going to have supply doing that this time around. The U.S. doesn't have a lot of production to bring to market. OPEC's not there, so it's really going to matter what demand does. And I see demand only getting better uh, over the next couple quarters. And so we're going to see prices are heading higher. Any names you like more than others right here, Mike? Go ahead, and, Brian. Any, any names that you like here? Not all oil and gas producers are built the same. Some are hedged. Some are unhedged. Different pricing points, different cost bases. Any oil and gas names you like more than others here? Yeah, John, uh, uh, Brian, we've been saying since the beginning of the year, we like oil services firms because activity is going to be improving, pricing is going to be improving, and earnings are going to be going up dramatically. So you can pick uh, names like, you know, Halliburton. You can pick names like Liberty, uh, Helmer and Payne. And the EMP side, you know, stick with some of the larger cap names. We like, we continue to like Devon. We continue to like Diamondback, Pioneer, Conoco, but there's a half a dozen more names. So go with the names that are delivering the most return of capital. Most of these companies are delivering between 10 and 15 percent return of capital. Mm. And, and some of these firms over the next three or four years are going to be buying back almost 40 to 50 percent of their market cap. So I, I, it really doesn't matter. Those are names we like. And on the refining side, we like P, you know, Phillips 66 as well. The PSX, right. So go OFS, oil field services, maybe over ENP exploration and production. Mike Bradley, the new firm Veritin. Mike, congrats on the new firm as well. Uh, thanks for joining us. Appreciate that. Tim, all right. So he's saying 
Oil field services, I know Guy has talked about Schlumberger's Day in the past. Your take on what Mike had to say. I'm sorry, Brian. I thought you said Tim. No, I will tell you, I'm with him 100%. I don't think we're anywhere close to demand destruction in terms of price. I, I didn't know that the administration is suing OPEC for price manipulation, which is almost laughable. I won't do it on this day. There'll be time for that, I'm sure. But I'll say this. Valero, every single day, makes an all-time high. PSX still has room on valuation. Marathon Petroleum, MPC, we talked about that name in the fall with Paul Sankey when it was a $60 stock. That still has room. So clearly oil didn't get the memo about fighting inflation. I think it continues to go higher from here. Yeah, there are three ways you're going to make money in, in the oil sector. One is that the weighting in the S&P is, is going to grow. Uh, I mentioned this. I'll mention it every time if I need to. At 4% weighting of the S&P in this environment, uh, when you have the fundamentals so good, it's going to, it's going to at least double back to its 20-year average. Uh, but then what companies are doing, ConocoPhillips, they just announced. I mean, this is, uh, as advertised, I think Wolf Research calls them the best two-way player, which means they're, they're exposed to the higher commodity prices, and yet they're going to return 10% back to to, to their shareholders. They actually even grew their, their CapEx uh, 8%, which, you know, starts to get you worried if it's old school. It's not what's going on. The sector has totally different capital discipline. This is what Mike referred to. They're buying back shares. That's the third leg of the stool. And I think they're all doing it. Royal Dutch uh, announced this morning uh, $9.1 billion in profit versus $3.1 a year ago. They're buying back a ton of stock. Uh, and I think they're very well positioned in terms of capital discipline.